forget the British Library is not only here for JLF weekend, we are here 365 days of the year for events and exhibitions and perhaps most preciously access, free access to that priceless thing, our collection. 200 million items, physical items, four petabytes of digital content that tell multiple stories, uh, including of course the stories of the relationship over the centuries between the UK and India. Uh, we're focusing on that particularly this year, not just with JLF, but of course it's the 75th anniversary of 1947 and independence. And there's a huge amount happening at the library over the next few months. We're working with the British Council for their UK India Together season. We have an exhibition of early Indian photography happening here in London and in Mumbai. And we are part of the UKRI's India 75 season with workshops, events and screenings and much more happening in the British Library. So do check out bl.uk to find out more about that. Uh, talking about the rich and complex histories uh, uh, of the UK and India, uh, there are few people who have done more to research and tell those stories than our next two speakers. Uh, they are two people who literally need no introduction to this crowd. So all I will say is, uh, William, great to have you back in what we call the National Library of the UK and what you call your London office. Uh, and Shashi, it's been three years since you've been here, but it's great to have you back lighting up the library again. So ladies and gentlemen, William Dalrymple, uh, Shashi Thoreau. Hello everyone, and delighted to be here again with William. We actually uh, had a conversation about this book at the at, at JLF in um, in Jaipur, and so it's wonderful to have a chance to reprise this. Uh, all too often in Indian publishing, it's the British book that comes out first, but here we have <laughs> an Indian conversation that did. Uh, and I know I can tell you that you're really in for a treat, because apart from what we're going to be saying to each other, William has a slideshow to show you that will take us through the history uh, that he has done in four books. Now, just a couple of things. Uh, the company quartet is indeed a quartet of four of his books. Uh, they were not published in the order in which they are meant to be read in the company quartet, uh, because he wrote them at different times. Uh, chronologically, we're looking at the history of uh, this rapacious corporate that took over India, uh, uh, the East India Company. Uh, the first book is really one of his more recent ones, The Anarchy. Uh, first book in terms of the historical evolution of their, of their uh, domination of India. Uh, the second is White Mughals, which has already been referenced a couple of times in conversations today on the stage. The third then takes us um, to Return of the King, which of course takes us also towards Afghanistan. And the fourth and final one is uh, The Last Mughal, uh, which is about uh, Bahadur Shah Zafar, the final uh, end of the British East India Company, because the so-called Indian Sepoy Mutiny, which many of us call the Indian Revolt, uh, ended the rule of the East India Company in India uh, and its, its uh, takeover by the British Crown. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll, we'll walk through that, that narrative in that order. Uh, and because, apart from everything else, the slides... Uh, will tell you such an interesting story about the way in which it's a uh, way in which it happened. And then as William speaks to the slides, I'll try and occasionally provoke uh, something out of him by way of a question. So William, uh, why don't you start unfolding the narrative? So I think we've actually got the wrong uh, the wrong presentation up. But it, so we, <laughs> this, is oh, just, well. this is just the anarchy. So it doesn't. So we'll go back to after we do the first one. We can go back to here we go. Oh no, this is anyway. All right, here we go. Um, well, first of all. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for this, uh, for sitting through an empire double bill um, with uh, first Satnam, now Shashi and I. Uh, I think next time we do this, we're going to get uh, Shashi to interview Satnam, and then we, I can just retire altogether and, <laughs> uh, uh, and give up. Um, but what a great privilege it is to be on with you, sir. Thank you again My for, privilege. for, My for pleasure. Um, being our frequent and most popular guest. And um, again, what you've done to bring this story to uh, to uh, audiences everywhere, not just in India, but here, is extraordinary. The story I've been telling over the uh, last 20 years uh, is not the whole story of the British in India. It's just the first half of the story. It's the story of the East India Company. 
Uh, and, I, and in none of my writing have I really gone beyond uh, the watershed of 1857. Uh, but this, the story I tell is, is a very surprising one, but I think a very important one, because it's actually two stories. On one hand, it's the story of the beginnings of British engagement with India and becoming the story of British colonialism in India. But on the other hand, it's the story of another major theme of our times, and one that, uh, like colonialism, only becomes more important um, with time, which is the story of the power of corporations. When we think of empires, we tend to think of uh, the power of the state and the way that states uh, can send armies, navies, uh, and task forces uh, over, over the borders, as is, ha is happening now in Ukraine, for example. Uh, that was ordered by Putin. The Russian army went in. The story of the British in India is the story of colonialism led by a corporation, which is both more sinister and more weird. Because in one of the most bizarre stories in world history, India, which was then the richest, greatest country in the world, was overwhelmed not by Britain the state, nor even England the state, which is what was engaged at that time, because the union hadn't happened but before 1707, but was overwhelmed bizarrely by one English company in one London office block in one street in London. And the office, office was five windows wide, I think you're right. And it's five windows wide. And we're going to see a picture of it in a second. Uh, and it's, it's not even a big office. It's a small office. It's much smaller than the British Library. Uh, and it did it by, and this is the complicating and extraordinary story, it did it by borrowing money from Indian bankers and buying with that money the services of Indian soldiers. And 95% of the armies of the East India Company were Indian. I mean, it's impossible to imagine anything like this happening. Uh, today. And the complicity of some and the complicity Indians. Of uh, some of the big bankers, particularly the Mawari. No, I don't just mean that, I mean but... things like the nobles. Okay, well, don't worry, we'll, we'll go with that. It's fine. What happened? We, we haven't got the company quartet, we've got the, I think, the anarchy. I may be wrong, we'll see. Well, anyway, whatever, it's all nice pictures. Uh, <laughs> you, you have a nice multicolored remote control. Exactly. Let's find out soon enough. <laughs> and um, so, the, yeah, the, the, so the four books tells that story, and it actually says there's, there's four of them. Anarchy is actually the first chronologically. White Moguls is, adds a certain nuance to the story because at the same time as the East India Company was looting and plundering India and sending its goods back to Britain, was also ironically the time when most um, multiracial interaction took place. That. Uh, by the 1780s, one in three British men in India has an Indian wife, girlfriend, or child, which they're leaving their goods Well, the to others were largely own. single. There weren't English women in India. It, at all. Exactly they that. Were, so. Exactly that. And um, the third story is the story of, the, of, of imperial hubris at its most dramatic, the story of the East India Company's catastrophic invasion of Afghanistan. An army marches in. Again, it's an Indian army. It's, it's, it's Biharis, people from UP, with a scattering of, of, of British officers. And everything goes wrong uh, because they don't, they don't read any of the signs and they misbehave in every imaginable way. They're massacred on the way out, at least according to legend. One man makes it through to uh, Jalalabad. In fact, a lot more get out, but it's a complicated story. Then finally, the fourth one is The Last Mughal, which is the story of Bharat Zafar, and in a sense, the last moment of the Mughal dynasty, uh, now shrunk almost to the walls of Delhi. Uh, and, uh, and how... The British, in 1857, provoked their own army of sepoys, the same army which had conquered Afghanistan, which had uh, been responsible for taking this, this corporate rule through India, is, uh, uh, turns on its own officers. So uh, badly behaved has the company been to its own troops that it turns it on officers and very, very nearly kicks the British out of India. Uh, and only, again, in a, in, a, in, a, in a sort of complicating fact, only because... Um, the Sikhs of the Punjab and the Pashtuns from, uh, from what's now Pakistan and Waziristan join and, and form a new army under corporate rule. They then take Delhi in September of 1857. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an uncomfortable and it's a difficult story for everyone. For British people, it's difficult because it's a story of how 
Uh, the people that we've been taught in our school lessons built a great and glorious empire, in fact, looted India uh, and took from India the money to build all the great Palladian villains. So when you see uh, some nice Sunday night drama where with Jane Austen with Colin Firth wading through some lovely river, <laughs> the chances are it was built with money from Bengal or the Caribbean slave trade. It's There's a actually a, a, a passage from Horace Walpole uh, taking a, a, a horse carriage down the street and literally counting the number of mansions built with Indian wealth. And, and, it, and it, it, you know, it, it, if you look at the, the state of Britain relative to the rest of Europe in the 17th century, Britain is behind Spain, Portugal, France, and Italy. How did it rise up through money from these two sources, the East India Company on one hand and the Caribbean slave trade in the other? Yesterday I was speaking... Uh, at uh, the Kite Festival, and there's a large Palladian mansion there, which was, uh, I didn't know this when I was giving the lecture, I only looked it up afterwards, it's Dashwoods. And some of the finest Zophonies are pictures of the Dashwood family in Calcutta, uh, and uh, it's all very lovely. But, you know, look at the figures, the money comes from slaves, and it comes from India. It's an absolute classic example of a beautiful 18th century mansion, the most perfect place to throw a beautiful summer festival, uh, lovely avenues, beautiful. It couldn't be more pleasing to the senses, but built on the back of slavery and exploitation and looting. And it's understanding that that's so important with this. So, to kick off, a lovely mansion. <laughs> uh, and this is Powys Castle on the borders of Wales and England. Perfect English box hedges, just the sort of thing we're talking about it, but inside, very different. More loot from India in that one room in Powys Castle than you'll find in the National Museum in Delhi, anywhere in Pakistan, anywhere in Afghanistan, or anywhere in Bangladesh. And what it has is lovely, look, uh, 18th century uh, Nawabi outfits, talwars, shields, spears, uh, ivory chess pieces, some major pieces of loot. Loot, of course, uh, as both our books point out, an Indian word, lootna, to plunder. Comes into England in the 18th century, why? Because this stuff is landing in, in Powys and elsewhere. And this is Siraj Dowler's palanquin, left on the left on the battlefield of Plassey uh, in 1857. Why is it there? Because this is Clive's own house, or ha the house that his, his, his descendants uh, ended up owning. Through that arch in the left-hand corner, uh, you'll find Tipu Sultan's uh, campaign tent, seized at the, uh, the attack, burning loot and plunder of Sri Rangapatnam when the city was just looted. And this is a story that, you, that tells how it happened and you, and you have to pass under it to get into the, to, to that amazing gallery. And it's a kind of nonsense picture because the, the painter, Benjamin West, had never been to India. One of the critics of the Royal Academy pointed out it looked like the, the Dome of St. Paul's rather than anything Indian <laughs> in the back. In the, and the scene depicted had no reality to, to the actual event taking place. What is being shown here is that the smiling figure um, in cloth of gold who is Shah Alam, the Mughal Emperor, is handing to the portly gentleman uh, in, uh, in, uh, in a red coat, uh, no, no portly jokes, read the shashi or die at this particular moment. Uh, and <laughs> and uh, what is happening there, uh, <coughs> sorry, what is happening there is that the, uh, a document called the Diwani is being passed to the East India Company. Now, um, the Diwani sounds like it's a nice sort of Diwali present or something. It's not. Uh, it's the right... Uh, to administer the finances of the three or four richest provinces of India, Bengal, Bihar, and Orissa. And it's being handed not to the British government, but to the representative of a company. And here is that house that Shashi mentioned. And look how modest it is. It's just the four windows in the middle. Five windows in the middle. It's set back from the street, so people passing by don't even have to uh, go anywhere near it. They have to get through the railings to get there. There's one entrance on the, on the left. And it's not even the two buildings on either side. They're different businesses. But from that building, the orders were issued and the decisions make, made, which resulted in everything. I mean, we wouldn't be sitting here today. The Indian British members of the audience would not be living in India. All the enormous imports of, of, of subsequent history start because of what happened in that building. It's an extraordinary tale. Does that physical building still exist or has it gone? It's it's not even a blue plaque. That's, in a sense, the sinister thing. It's, you know, this is one of the most important things. It starts imperialism. It's, you know, for better or That's worse, right. it completely changes the world. 
but there's nothing. There's not a blue plaque. There's not a sign. There's not even a kind of tiny what thing. What stands on the there now? The Lloyd's Insurance Building. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> And this company has a founder. This is the guy. His name is Auditor Smythe, and he's a chartered accountant. Um, and he has the idea of trying to copy what the Dutch are doing, which is to go directly to the producers of spices, not in India at this stage, but in what he calls the East Indies, which means in our modern parlance, Indonesia. And specifically, there are islands off the coast of, of New Guinea, in fact, Banda uh, and Run. And so he calls a startup meeting. Like, like anyone today starting a tech startup or something, and they, you know, they want to gather some investors, <coughs> that's what he does. And here are the first investors. And this document, where is it? 500 yards away uh, in the British Library. As is every si single subsequent slip of paper that ever uh, passed through East India House, Leadenhall Street. It's now here, in the British Library, underground. Said to be 35 miles of East India Company papers. I don't know whether that's a complete myth, but... Uh, if you look at the catalogues, it just goes on and on and on. And one can only imagine the hole in the ground beneath here, deep enough to hold all this stuff. And you can read it. Here, number one, Mayor of London, £200. Secondly, uh, some guy's given £1,000, then £200, then £300, then 1000 and 1000 So this is literally the startup. And when they've got the money, they need to ship. So they get hold of this guy who's just come back. He sank his previous ship, the one in the picture. Uh, but still, no one else has been to Indonesia, so they, they hire him. And uh, they go to Blackwell, and they try and get a nice uh, ship. They find a pirate ship. Its name, and I'm not making this up, this is, you know, it sounds like something out of Johnny Depp and, uh, uh, not Amber Head, but out, out Johnny Depp and Pirates of the Caribbean. Uh, it's the Scourge of Malice. It's a pirate ship. So they buy the pirate ship, and being a clever corporate, they rebrand it, and they call it uh, the Red Dragon, as if it's a nice country pub in Wales or something. <laughs> and off they set, and they duly get to Indonesia, and in Indonesia, um, off the coast of Indonesia, they see a Portuguese ship coming the opposite direction. It's full of spices. Because they are pirates, they board it. Uh, and they transfer the contents into their own hold and sail back to London and sell it for a million pounds. And with that, they buy this, which is the first India, India uh, headquarters. It looks like a pub. It's lovely. Um, but that's on the site, and that site remains the place where India is run until 1857. Um, they then buy a harbour at Deptford, where they start making ships. And all goes well until this man, very popular with the current Prime Minister, this is Aurangzeb, um, who, who featured in an exclusive slot in the Independence Day speech uh, for the Red Fort this year. Uh, and he, once he overreaches, and once the Marathas bounce back, and begin looting all the Mughal territories and, and, and capturing Surat, the major, uh, the major Mughal port, it all begins to collapse. And the whole Mughal edifice, which has been secure and, and, and extremely prosperous, particularly for the ruling elite for, for 200 years, begins to collapse. And, and, the, uh, and Delhi is sitting, a city of a million people, the richest and largest city between Istanbul and Tokyo, Edo. Uh, and it's gorgeous. This is a little bit later. This is in the 1850s, but you can see what we're talking about. No smog, no pollution. Uh, gorgeous, uh, <laughs> gorgeous canal running up the middle of Chandichauk until this guy turns up. And everyone's at this point wondering whether it's going to be, is it the Marathas are going to get to loot Delhi? Is it going to be the Jats who are, who are in Deeg? Is it going to be the Sikhs in the Punjab? In the end, it's none of them. It's this guy, the Persian, Nadir Shah. Modest birth, manages to... Uh, uh, manages to overthrow the Safavid dynasty and invent some, some exciting gizmos that can pierce Mughal armor called, uh, uh, called a, a swivel gun, which can be fitted to a horse. And with this, he invades Afghanistan, captures Kabul, no resistance, comes down, captures Peshawar, still no sign of any resistance, captures Lahore. And by this time, the Mughal Empire finally sort of rumbles into, into life. And three Mughal armies converge on the plain of Karnal near Mirut. Uh, but the whole of sort of Khan Market turns up too. Ladies in Dior, Dior sunglasses and, uh, <laughs> uh, and all this sort of stuff. And, it, and dancing girls. And it's a bit of a mess. The army is not in fighting shape. And a very small army of 160,000 Persians destroys a 1.5 million camp, at least, uh, of, of, of Mughal soldiers, leading to 
Um, Mind you, that camp had a, a large, what's called teeth to tail, I mean, a small teeth to tail ratio. Yes, the the tail was tail. much la larger than the fighting teeth. Exactly that, exactly that. Uh, Nadir Shah invites, on the right, invites Muhammad Shah Rangila on the left to tea. Uh, idiotic Muhammad Shah Rangila goes with just a small bodyguard and is captured. They then march in together into Delhi. Six weeks later, they leave, and Nadir Shah takes with him the Kohinoor. Now, I'm told... Peacock Throne. <laughs> Peacock Throne. And, and, and so much loot and so much money from Delhi that the people of Persia didn't have to pay any taxes for the next three years. And, and 8,000 wagons. And when you go to, to Tehran today, some of the most beautiful objects in the, in, in, in the palaces uh, are, are the, 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 the lost Mughal treasures of Delhi. Uh, ditto, bizarrely, top Kapi Palace in Istanbul, because in Istanbul... Uh, Nadir Shah sends, as a, uh, just to irritate his, his enemies, the Ottomans, a scattering of the trifles that he's found. And they are today the, the highlights of the, of the Topkapi Palace. So the gorgeous Mughal things which aren't in Delhi uh, are, are, are actually, and even before the Brits were able to get their hands on them, they're actually in, in, in Topkapi and in <laughs> Leningrad and in, uh, and in Tehran. Um, and then as the Mughal Empire unravels, because it's as if, a big Baroque mirror has been thrown out of a window, shattered into a thousand pieces. Um, all these different states, Jogpur, Jaipur, Tanjore, Hyderabad, uh, all, all the different Maratha states, all, all, all slightly at odds with each other, none coordinating resistance against the imperial powers. Both France and Germany import new military techniques from Britain. One thing, I think we should clarify. The Mughal Empire was indeed... Uh, in control of, of pretty much the entire subcontinent. It had appointed provincial governors. Remember, communications are pretty meager in those days. Provincial governors throughout the states and so on, but they definitely owed uh, fealty to the Mughal emperor. In fact, when Nadir Shah was in Delhi and he was massacring people left, right, and center, our chap from the Nizam from Hyderabad showed up in Delhi to try and negotiate uh, terms on which the uh, Nadir Shah could leave. That's right. I mean, it, the whole thing was just incredible. But, but once it was done, the depleted Mughal throne was not in any condition to, to really exercise the same sort of control again. And then, as William says, what you've got is you've got a whole, all these provincial governors, as it were, became de facto uh, mini kings. That's, that's why you suddenly had a whole collection of states out of what had once been one empire, and that's what made it slightly easier pickings for the East India Company. And this may look like a sort of pride parade, but it's not. This is actually the leading <laughs> military technology of its day. And, and these are sepoys trained in the latest uh, fighting techniques developed by Frederick the Great of Prussia. Uh, they, they use muskets. They don't fight on horseback. Uh, they use horse artillery uh, and later 18th century ballistics. And this new type of warfare can take on anything that the Mughals or the Marathas can throw at it for about 40 years. And it only takes Indian courts 40 years to master and beat the, the company at this. But in that time, crucially, the company captures the most rich provinces of India. And just as India, had, uh, just as the Mughal Empire had actually been funded mainly on the proceeds of Bengal and its million looms, it was, India was the superpower of textiles. And it exported these textiles, which were world-beating textiles all over the globe. So much so that even in Mexico, there is de-industrialization because of the massive export of, uh, of Indian cotton. Who is exporting it? It's the East India Company. And they are making their money taking magnificent Indian goods and, and then taking the, the, the markup. And it should be pointed out that they were taking those Indian goods, which they were paying for through Indian taxes. It, it wouldn't actually cost them anything to take this off. And, and so they were extracting taxes from the Indian peasants in places like Bengal, Orissa, and Bihar, and then buying all the stuff and shipping it off. It should also be said that, I mean, this thing says 1780, but of course, the big conquest, uh, you're going to come to the Battle of yeah. Plassey in 1757, that kind of broke the back. Uh, of, of, of Bengal and thereafter the story. Well, William tells it well, I'm going to leave him to do it. Just wanted to mention two things. One is, of course, that if you look at the, the entire uh, uh, conquest by the East India Company, um, it actually starts off small but good. Now, what had happened was between about 1614 and about the 1750s or so, you did have a British presence in various ports. The East India Company 
uh, created warehouses. And they, for some obscure reason, which maybe some Englishman can explain, uh, they were called factories, but they weren't actually manufacturing anything. I, I, I'm a Scotsman, but I can explain. <laughs> uh, it, because they contained the factors. Who were the, the people? The people who, were the factors. The factors. So the place where the factors lived was the factory. Was the factory. <laughs> there you are. So all these factories, which are all in port enclaves, but that's all they actually controlled. Uh, but now you pick up the story from there because you've gone too fast to 1780. So we'll go back. So now just going back. So this. Yeah. So right. all the, the kind of crucial turning point is when this character, Siraj Dowler, captures Calcutta, and he's irritated because the East India Company has, without any permission at all, fortified Calcutta, put up or, or rebuilt the walls, and added new cannons. Now, he thinks, understandably, this is probably aimed at him, at keeping his authority out, partly because any of the, one of the ways that the East India Company had managed to um, uh, work so successfully is it was like Singapore or Dubai. The rich Indian merchants, particularly the Mawari bankers from then Rajasthan, had been attracted to Calcutta by tax-free status. So within the walls... Uh, if you were you, you you know if you were sitting in in the middle of Bikaner, you'd have to pay something to uh, the Maharaja of Jodhpur, the Maharaja of Bikaner, or whoever it was. But if you were in Calcutta, the East India Company gave you tax-free status, and that's how they won over the bankers. So the bankers were on the side at this point. They, he thinks that, that this armament is aimed at him to keep him out, to, to, so he can't tax the place. He's wrong. What's actually happening is that the French and the English are, 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 are beginning to think about fighting what will become the First World War, uh, known in America as the French and Indian Wars, known here as the Seven Years' War. And a piece of false intelligence, rather like the false intelligence that started the Iraq War, there is false intelligence that the uh, French are about to send a massive fleet full of cannons to India. In actual fact, that fleet was going off to Canada to fight the, maybe all that Daniel Day-Lewis stuff, Last of the Mohicans, all that war. <laughs> so it was off to fight that war. So they send a task force, and it's led by this man, the young Robert Clive. And Robert Clive arrives off the coast of Madras, expecting to find a large French fleet, and there's nothing there. It's gone off to Montreal, gone off to Quebec, wherever, onto the, the coast of Canada. Um, but instead, uh, he, he's only been there a week, twiddling his thumbs, wondering how he's going to explain this to his superiors. He's gone halfway around the world, and there's no one to fight, when news comes that, ben, uh, that Calcutta has fallen. So he just goes north. And he takes Calcutta, and he writes to his father that he's going back again, and at least he's achieved something. At that point, a letter arrives from a man called the Jagat Set. And Jagat Set is the biggest banker in Bengal. He's the biggest banker in India. And he has already appointed Siraj Dada, effectively appointed Siraj Dada's grandfather, Ali Verdi Khan. And now he's pissed off with, with, with Siraj Dada for a rich variety of good reasons, because Siraj Dada sounds a very unpleasant young man. And he writes to Clive and says, will you help me topple this man? And I will give you one million pounds personally, and I'll give the company one million pounds in addition. And Clive says, yes, please. And he marches his troops without any authorization from anyone else. From, he doesn't, he doesn't tell, tell uh, Madras. He certainly hasn't got time to tell London. Uh, so he just marches up, and he defeats Siraj Adela, and he walks into his treasury, and he literally fills his pockets. And he then ships what's left of the treasury down in punts, down the Hooghly, to Fort William in Calcutta. And when he's called before Parliament years later and told to explain himself why he thought he could just fill his pockets with all this stuff, he says, my lords, I was astonished at my own moderation. <laughs> uh, and, and rather like one of, sort of Boris Johnson's jokes in Parliament, so at the moment everyone laughs and forgets that anything's happened at all and Partygate moves off. Now, in, for context, you should know that India was such a rich country, according to the... Oxford historian Angus Madison, India accounted for about 27% of global GDP in 1700, 23% as late as 1800. Uh, but what is more, the revenues that Aurangzeb, when he was Mughal emperor, collected were more than those of the revenues of every single European monarch combined at that point. So that's how rich the place was. And, and when Clive... Is, is generated by the Mughal Empire. That's right. And around 3 to 7% is generated by England. No, 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 by well, Europe. England, well, England is less than... Less England than is less than 1% of that point. Yeah. Because England, as you rightly pointed out, was poorer than Portugal, poorer than France, and so on. So England... In fact, there, 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 there are accounts of, uh, of, of English shopkeepers 
trying to pass off shoddy English-made goods as Indian in order to get a higher price. <laughs> and made in India actually commanded a higher price in these 17th, 18th centuries in England. But anyway. So we, we, we managed to gossip away and nearly run out of time, but we're going to go canter through at least one. All right, you can turn, I shall. Um, no, no, please. So, um, hang on. So, a few years after this Battle of Buxar, um, the East India Company fights not just uh, the Nawab of Bengal, but the Nawab of Avad, Shuja Udala, and the Mughal Emperor Shah Alam, and defeats them all. Again, it's a very tight run thing. There's absolutely no um, certainty that this, the battle is going to go this way. In fact, for quite a lot of it, run like one of those football matches where right up until the last minute, you think one side's going to win, and then there's two quick goals at the end. That's like what the Battle of Buxar is like. And suddenly, by 1765 the company finds that it's actually got control of all the richest areas of what we today call the cow belt, the whole of the Gangetic Valley. And they quickly um, send, their, uh, they, you, they, they send their tax collectors to collect all the taxes, and they spend the money to build up their armies. So from 7,000 sepoys at the time of Plassey, it's up to 40,000 by the 1780s, and by the 1800, you have 200,000 sepoys fighting for the East India Company at a time when the British army in the same year, 1799, has only 100,000 troops. So you have 200,000 troops being owned and run by a multinational corporation uh, just sitting on one London office block. So Paid for entirely by Indian revenues and also by the wonderful mafia technique of going to small potentates and saying to them, you do need protection. Uh, and the guy says, oh, I don't need protection. So we think you do, because you might be attacked by us if you don't accept our protection. <laughs> and this actually happened time after time. And they collected very fat fees from these kings who got their protection. It was a classic mafia technique. And uh, then they realized that having conquered places like Bihar, that they can grow drugs there. So they start growing opium. And they then ship the opium to China uh, illegally, fight two opium wars, including capturing Hong Kong, uh, and then they ship, they, then they, with the profits of the opium, by which stage, incidentally, they are the largest narco operation in history, and makes the meddling cartel uh, and, uh, and Pablo Escobar look like sort of Andy Pandy and the uh, <laughs> Bill and Ben, the flowerpot man. Uh, and they use that money to buy tea, which they then sell to the Indians, onto, the, uh, onto Europe, and to the Americans. And it is East India Company tea that is dumped in Boston Harbor in the outbreak of the American Revolution. So by this stage, that little startup that we saw at the beginning with that one document with the very first subscriptions has transformed and morphed like that, you know, that the creature in Alien from the little kind of thing that pops out of John Hurt's chest uh, into the kind of horrible monster that uh, you have by then. The East India Company straddles America, Europe. It's got... Uh, a flag that, mod that is the model for the American future American flag. Uh, that little nice Tudor pub we saw has been transformed into sort of Buckingham Palace. <laughs> and that room is what Racecourse Road is today. That's where decisions are made that affect everyone in India, still in the same office block. Now, in all fairness, William, the one reproach I have for your book is that you actually slightly underplay the extent of complicity of the British ruling establishment with the company. It was indeed the rapacious corporate you describe, but a phenomenal percentage of parliament had shares in it. I think 26% of the MPs in the 1770s actually had shares in East India Company. When required, they would pass helpful laws, bailing these chefs out of trouble, loaning them money, and so on. And beyond a point, senior appointments were actually cleared with the palace. And, so, with the government. and this becomes more so as time yeah, goes on. So that's right. what starts off is a relatively independent uh, operation sure. operating on a royal charter, but nonetheless uh, uh, commercially and, and organizationally independent. After they asset strip Bengal and, and, and strip the place clean, in 1772 there is a massive famine. Now this happens throughout Indian history, it's not unique, but any sort of responsible ruler will have uh, grain in granaries, which they'll have prepared, uh, and organize soup kitchens and employment for the starving people so that they can wade over this, the, the, the difficult years. You, you prepare in the years of plenty so that in the years of famine. The East India Company does nothing. It's got no grain. It exports grain out of famine-affected areas. And um, f at that point, it goes bust. It, first of all, uh, in, sends out its sepoys into the countryside and extracts taxes at the point of a bayonet. 
and for one year, 1772, succeeds still in getting its full tax revenue. And when the news comes to London and the annual shareholders meeting, they increase the dividend they pay themselves from 10 to 12.5%, although 3 million, or the figures are disputed, but between 1 and 5 million, certainly, uh, Bengalis have died that year. But obviously, this is not a sustainable model. So by the next year, the East India Company uh, has gone virtually bankrupt. And there is a moment rather like the, uh, the subprime collapse of 10 years ago in the States, when one bank after another goes over, and they have to go to the British government to bail them out. And that's the moment when what has been a, an independent or a semi-independent corporation, certainly supported by the establishment, as Shashi says, and an and, uh, entirely pliant and complicit parliament, who are many of whom is increasingly throughout the 18th century, more and more of the MPs are ex-nabobs anyway, coming home and spending their money on a rotten borough. But after 1774, it ceases to be something that's owned entirely by its shareholders because the government has taken a 50% share, rather like NatWest at the, uh, 10 years ago. Uh, and so from that point, you have government becoming more and more involved in the daily running. They start sending out governor generals. Uh, and as you say, it becomes this, uh, what we today would call a public-private partnership. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. By this stage, there are massive docks with all the goods coming in from India and elsewhere. More docks, this is the Brunswick dock, uh, where all the ships are being built. It's, I mean, it looks rather like a massive airport. Imagine each one of these is a clipper taking opium or tea all around the globe. And all continues increasing government control, but the final moment is 1857. What in India is called the First War of Independence, what we still hear uh, called the Sepoy Mutiny. We both use neutral terms, the uprising or the great uprising. Or the revolt. Or the revolt or the great revolt. Uh, when its own troops rise up against it. And that's the point at which uh, there is massive uh, recrimination. People talk about the Amritsar massacre, and terrible as it was, there are infinitely worse massacres in 1857 to 8, when not uh, 100 or 200 or 1,000, but tens, possibly hundreds of thousands of innocent civilians are benetted, hung, massacred, uh, in, a, in, in, in a campaign of violence that leaves such a terrible legacy that there is not a stirring of rebellion for another 30, 40 years because people are so terrified of the, of the massive killings that have taken 100, place. 100,000 in one day in Delhi alone were butchered by the, the Brits, 1858. And such is the embarrassment uh, that this causes that this finally is the last straw and the East India Company, which is already now a semi-government-run a semi uh, organization, is wound up and nationalized in our terms. And this is the punch cartoon. They've heard all the stories about the East India Company blowing sepoys from the mouths of cannon. Uh, and what they send, uh, what, they, what, they, uh, what they show is East India Company House, the Buckingham Palace that we saw uh, being blown from the mouth of the cannon. Uh, and the, uh, the banners are reading nepotism, blundering, avarice, misgovernment, and supineness. Just to end with a quote uh, before handing back to Shashi. During the trial of Warren Hastings, which is the only moment when, um, five, <laughs> uh, only moment when uh, Parliament actually confronts the East India Company with its, with its atrocities. Uh, and in my opinion, they've, they've aimed it at the wrong man because Clive, uh, Clive is a much worse character than, than Hastings, who at least enjoys Indian culture, reads the Bhagavad Gita and so on. When he comes out for trial, there is a wonderful uh, quote given by the uh, Lord Chancellor who stands at the bar and charges Hastings. And he said, and it's as true today as, uh, as it was then, he says, corporations have neither uh, bodies, uh, bodies um, to be punished nor souls to be condemned. They therefore do as they like. Wonderful. So that, that, that was how the East India Company got to where it got to. Uh, there are four books that tell the story. Uh, since we have five minutes before we open it up to the audience, uh, while you're thinking of your questions and comments, a couple of things I, I'd, like, uh, I'd like William to sort of bring out uh, farther. So one of the things that I always found troubling was the British pretense, I think Sir John Seeley was one who said this, that they had acquired the empire in a fit of absent-mindedness. It seems to me there was a very, very systematic uh, desire uh, to, to, to acquire territory, to, to annex places. In fact, there were policies specifically designed. For example, if you didn't have a male heir, your property was forfeit to the company, that sort of thing. So a lot of, lot of territories were annexed 
as a matter of deliberate policy. Would you agree with that, or is it, is it, am I being too... Yes and no. Um, it, again, the difficulty when talking about both the British and India in general, but and with the, the company history in particular, is you're talking very long periods of history. The company is founded in 1599. Uh, the Plassey doesn't happen until 1765, which is 150, 160 years later. Uh, the government doesn't get involved till 1757 was Blassey, actually, but yeah, still. 1757 mm. is Blassey. And uh, the government doesn't get involved until um, the Regulating Act, which is 1774. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there are different things true at different times. And mm -hmm. then 18, 1858, the, the company is wound up. But the, I mean, no one had anticipated Siraj Dawla attacking uh, attacking uh, Calcutta. So, or Mir Jaffa betraying him, or which Mir we didn't Jaffa betraying him. That's, um, that's a nobleman, actually, a relative of his. Well, he was, he was part of the plot. He was also... Clive and he were working for the same guy. The Jagged Set was paying both Mir Jaffa... And, and Clive. Uh, and Clive. And so... Um, the... It, 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 you get, it's a complicated picture, because you, it, no one planned that. That was not uh, part of some imperial master plan laid down in Leadenhall Street. But you do get constant pressure on the ground to advance territory. Now, if you're an East India Company officer, you actually have quite a low salary. And it's assumed that you have to get your, make the difference up through loot. How, you can't loot unless there's a war. Uh, and what the rules of the war were at that stage, that if a, if a, if a city uh, surrendered, there would be no looting. But if it fought, the, the loot would be given to the soldiers and the greatest proportion to the officers, then to the men, then to the sepoys, the smallest bit of all. Um, so there was a constant incentive for the smallest grievances or the smallest opportunity to be taken. And what you find is that the letters from London, from the East India Company, are saying what we want is trade. We want to get on and, and make a profit. We've got a very nice model here. We can make a ton of money. War, however, is expensive for us, and it reduces our profit. War is always expensive. I mean, you know, currently in Ukraine, it's it, mm. both sides are hemorrhaging money. Um, and this was as true in the 18th century, too. So the East India Company financiers and accountants sitting in the boardroom in London are quite keen on, a, on what they call a quiet trade. But there's always incentive for the officers and the soldiers on the ground to take the offensive and make their fortunes. That's right. And they, they didn't make any bones about it. There were very, very, there were many, many contemporary documents, letters, statements, and so on. But they open about the fact that they are in India to make money. And there's a charming letter I quote in Glorious Empire uh, from a, a young man of, uh, who writes to his father that how the best place in the world for a young Englishman of no particular distinction to make a fortune is to save in India. That, that was exactly and This, I think, is, the, is, the, is why it's so rewarding, in a sense, to concentrate on the East India Company, because the East India Company makes no bones at all about what it's up to. It's Whereas when the British government takes over after 1857, you get the rationalizations as Victorian morality comes in. And, and enlightenment, talk of civilizing missions. Civilizing and, mission, yeah. exactly. The East India Company, refreshingly, uh, I mean, while it, you know, it loots, kills, rapes, asset strips, it doesn't pretend that it's there and save the children. That's or, right. Or, you know. <laughs> and it really was, was, even then it was quite cynical. I mean, it, it's been pointed out by, again, a British historian, that when the Victorians actually set up famine relief camps, which the East India Company had never done, uh, they made them work camps. And they actually gave, the rations they gave, he said, was somewhat less than the concentration camp prisoners in Buchenwald got before they were sent off to the gas chambers. That's how little they were paid in order to be able to survive enough to work to earn their relief. But when in this country you confront empire nostalgists like, our, uh, like Oliver Dowden of the Tory party who, who, who has, has begun these major culture wars that are going on, saying that people like me who, who criticize empire or attack it are unpatriotic, you can point out that the East India Company is very clear that it's there to make money. It's not, you know, there's no, there's absolutely no hypocrisy at all. They're there to make money, and they do. And they take money from India, and they bring it here. Okay, one thing we haven't talked about, you, you mentioned the, the sort of non-racial period, the white Mughal period, uh, basically late, late 18th century. I think about 1820 or so, the so-called fishing fleet starts coming, when the ships are more comfortable, the seas are safer, and more women uh, come out to India looking for husbands. Can you tell us about that? Sure. But, and, and, and one of my favorite characters writes about this, who's called Hindu Stuart, who's this, who's this um, officer based in, in Bengal. And when the, 
what happens is that all the English women who failed to find a husband in the in the first season or two seasons are sent out to India. And the Spinsters idea is, age twenty. And, and and the idea is that they will they will find some poor chap sitting in a bungalow in Madhya Pradesh and and, and they'll live happily ever after. Uh, but of course, when they first come out. Uh, everyone uh, has got a kind of, you know, Ashwari Arai at the back. And so all these spinsters have to go, have to go back straight, uh, straight away. And they're called very cruelly returned empties. Returned um, empties. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, uh, uh, so initially, I mean, the figures are very interesting. And, we, and, and how do we know the figures? The figures, are, again, contained here in the British Library. Because so many young men who joined the East India Company never came back. In fact, three quarters of them never came back. So it was a big gamble. If you joined the East India Company, the chances were that you, you know, you, if you were very lucky, you could build Cutlington Park where I was yesterday. But the mo more likely outcome was that, like a lottery, that you would you would die. You could your... die in war. You could die of malaria. No, you could die quite so simply. It was never the you know the, the super toffs and, and and the London elite that went out. It was poor Scots uh, with social aspirations. They had to have enough connections to get into the East India Company, but they had to be desperate enough. In other words, exactly the sort of thing my family was, which were socially aspirational Scots trying to pay for expensive habits that they couldn't afford. Right. Um, well, <laughs> <laughs> let me just end with one small nugget, quite literally. When Thomas Spitt uh, was governor of, of Madras, he purloined a diamond, which he then managed to ship off in safety to England, which, when sold to the Duc d'Orléans, made him instantly the wealthiest man in England, allowed him to buy a gigantic mansion and to found a dynasty that went on to produce two British prime ministers, William Pitt and, and Pitt the Younger, Earl of Chatham. So there you have the, the kind of scale of, of, of wealth. When, when William talks about the gamble, you might die, but you might also just come back and become the richest man in England. And this was not unusual. It was typically diamonds that were used because yeah. if, if you accumulated a fortune in India, if you brought it back in goods or in money, you got taxed. Right, but if you could hide some diamonds up in there, pocket. show them in your pockets, or do or do you know do whatever dodgy way you could, or send them to Amsterdam and then buy them back from Amsterdam, which is what Warren Hastings did. Uh, that was how you how you avoided paying the British Exchequer uh, for, uh, to tax your your Indian loot. Ah, corporates so. <laughs> and their senior executives always know how to do the tax dodge. Okay, think, questions. Can, can I say mm, one, one last thing? Yeah. So the corporate element is something. Perhaps we could just say one last thing. The, the what I think this shows. We talk mainly in a sense of the imperial side of the story. What is also interesting about the East India Company is it shows for the first time how a very large corporation can overthrow a country. And today, of course, we're in a situation where corporations such as Google or Facebook or Tesla uh, or uh, ExxonMobil have t annual turnovers greater than the whole of sub-Saharan Africa. Mm. And as a result, and this is nothing new, and these guys learned their tricks, in a sense. The first, the prototype, is the East India Company. And what you find is that as early as, I mean, it's, something, it's a constant through history. The East India Company is wrapped up in 1857, but say in 1950, the Anglo-Persian Anglo Oil Company uh, what, is worried that Mossadegh, the first democratically elected leader of Iran, will nationalize their very profitable corporation. And what do they do? Uh, they get the MI6, uh, and the CIA. Uh, MI, uh, MI6 and the CIA together to do a sting operation, and Mossadegh is overthrown, and they're saved. So you get, a, you get, a, you get a, a corporation overthrowing a government. The same happens two years later in Guatemala, where United Fruit is going to have all its banana farms uh, nationalized by the Guatemalan socialist government. What do they do? CIA come in. They're overthrown, and the phrase banana uh, republic, republic is born. Republic is born, exactly. <laughs> and then finally, I suppose, 1977 in Chile. ITT is being, uh, is being uh, uh, overtaxed and, uh, and its interests threatened by Salvador Allende. Again, CIA coup, the corporation is protected. This may or may not have been the story in the invasion of Iraq. Uh, why, when 9-11 plotters were all Saudi Arabians, is it Iraq that's attacked next? Arguably, it's because of ExxonMobil uh, and the oil reserves. So the idea that a corporation can bring about change uh, and, and, very, and bring down governments massively uh, is something that is started by the East India Company. And today, even you know, the Google or, or Facebook or, or, or Twitter, these are vast corporations. They may not have armies, but they harvest our data. Tomorrow, you're all going to get adverts for East India Company tea in your social media feeds because you're in this room. And <laughs> right. Questions from the audience? Oh, lots of hands. 
why don't we give this gentleman's lady here uh, the first one? And okay, we'll, we'll sort of go like this, left, center, right, and come back again. Okay. Hi, um, I'm an American recently relocated to London. And America experienced British colonialism kind of concurrently as what was going on in India. Oh, right here. <laughs> yeah, so America was experiencing British colonialism in parallel often with what was happening in India. How much did what was going on in America influence the East India's strategy or decision making in India? Not talking into this, sorry. When the Bengal famine happened in 1772, for the first time, because you couldn't, there were no sort of Christina Lambs jetting in or, or great war correspondents like Pallavi Iyer turning up and, uh, uh, and uh, reporting from the front line in the 18th century. And you had to have an East India Company passport to get into India at all. So very little about the atrocities was reaching back here. There was a vague sense that these guys were making money far too quickly and on a far great, too great a scale for it to be honest. So there's a great undercurrent of distrust of East India Company money when it comes back. But no one's sure of the details until the horrors in 1772 are so great that you get a whole load of whistleblowers who write reports. One of them is called William Boltz. Uh, and there's, there's, there's three or four, and they write these anonymous reports initially in things like the Gentleman's Magazine and the Spectator, and these reach America. So they start to read about the East India Company, and at the same time, the East India Company is trying to, to recruit its money, uh, and there's that whole business of the, of the tea tax, which is imposed in America. So it's strongly related, and it's partly, it's in, it's in the years following 1772, 3, 4, when these newspapers published in London begin to reach their readers in Massachusetts, that people are terrified that the East India Company is going to be let loose on them. And it's a major part of Patriot, uh, 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 one of the main reasons that the Patriots turn against the Brits is fear of the East India Company. No, and that was very much there at the time. Uh, but it, but you know, patriotic American historians don't bring it out because it's of no really interest to them. It takes someone with a South Asian background to, to spot this and, 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 in a sense, run with this one. There's a delicious footnote to this, which is that Lord Cornwallis, after surrendering in Yorktown, shows up in Bengal, yeah, and, and then proceeds actually to create... Just a, like one of the, you know, the ex-American presidents. What's that, what's that corporation that employs ex-presidents? And, uh, <laughs> and they all get paid very handsomely. Iran Corporation. Uh, corporation. Uh, and all the Bushes are kind of lined up, getting enormous salaries. These two companies like that. So, so Cornwallis is out of a job after the fall of America. Oh, we'll have you. Come and run our colony. <laughs> Come and run Bengal. Yes, the gentleman the big shirt. Yeah, you got Hi. Um, so I grew up in the Republic of India, and this is a crown-related question coming up. I want to challenge, and if I may question, your framing in this conversation of the East India Company as a corporation. So companies' houses have evolved quite a lot in the past few decades, going all the way back, way back to 1599 when you putatively said the East India Company was formed by the parliamentarians and the monies of the Lo uh, Lord Mayor of London, etc., uh, for a putative amount of four million quid in today's money and times. I'm intrigued for a company, let's, let's still go with the thesis, it's a company and a company's house, and you showed the share register on your screen. It was still a year after or so that they went to the Crown slash the Queen to get a royal charter. They were denied it, but very soon after they got it. And in a free market, you don't have monopolistic rights. They did have monopolistic rights. They did have the parliament and the crown supporting them to go to both. And they had the right to use force granted to them by the queen. Wage war. And they had the Wage right. War. Wage war. And they had Wage those war. rights as well, which no corporation like Google to, uh, and, and others, I don't want to go on naming them, have those rights in today's world. So could you please... I'll challenge that framing. No, no, this is, it's a very important matter, and, and it's certainly something that's open to debate. The, the East India Company has a charter from the Queen, and as Shashi says, it not only gives them the right to trade east of Suez, uh, it has a whole range of extraordinary other rights, which apparently they weren't even half expecting. It's sort of, you know, some clerk drafts this thing out, and they say, great, because it gives them a right, a right to wage war, mint coins, control territory, 
and a whole load of other rights that they hadn't actually expected. But nonetheless, it, despite having a crown charter and being given the, the right to do this, the, the company is organizationally independent. But it is at all stages supported by the state. So when Clive uh, arrives in, uh, in India to fight the French, he's come on Royal Navy ships. But when uh, at the Diwani, uh, the entire right to administer Bengal, Bihar, and Orissa in 1765 is signed off, it isn't signed to the British government. It's signed to the, uh, the, com uh, to the company. So the company plays it both ways. It runs with the hands and, uh, uh, and, 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 and runs with the hair. It the can, best of both worlds. Yeah, it, it's the best of both worlds. And Lucia, and, yeah. sorry. I'm, we're trying to rush through. There are lots of hands up. Yeah. Uh, so how differently did the money that came back from India, from the empire, from East India come? A little closer, please. Sorry. Uh, how differently did that money affect different strata of British society? Of course, that created something like nabobs, etc., uh, who were probably not the royalty. But sometimes, since we've been here, what, we, what I see is that potentially it's still the lower strata of British society was still untouched by the money that came in. Is that correct? So it's right and it's wrong. So it, you're absolutely right. This is a highly stratified period of, uh, 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 and English society is, is one of the most highly stratified uh, in, in, in Europe. And so the people who are making the real bucks are certainly the, 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 those in, in the East India Company at the top of the tree. They're not, as I say, the dukes, the lords, the, the super toffs. Uh, they are the middle rank, vicar's sons, minor Scots gentry, people who are prepared to take the risk uh, and got enough extra sons to send out in the hope that one of them may win the what they sometimes call the Great Indian Lottery. And one of them will come back with enough money and a big diamond to do it. But by the 1780s, the East India Company is the biggest employer in the country. And it employs not only the uh, people who are sitting working in the East India Company house, the clerks in Bengal, who are always quite small in number. At the time of Plassey, there's only 250. Um, but they also employ millions of people running the warehouses, making the sails, building the ships. Uh, and so if you count all that stuff, they are the biggest employer in the country and the biggest single component of the economy. Right. Gentlemen here. Yeah. Uh, William Shashi, fantastic discussion. Um, just <clears throat> one additional point that I... You talked about, William, with the British Library having all of these documents and uh, you know a whole treasure trove of uh, uh, information. Uh, I recently discovered something which had probably just the same amount, which is still undiscovered, is the National Army Museum in Chelsea. Yeah. I don't know if you've gone there, but that's actually, place. Uh, it's a fabulous place where the entire British Army, and I'm, I'm assuming a lot of the East India Company artifacts that were then absorbed into the British Army, what each of these soldiers and their you know, superiors, what they carried around in their pockets and brought back to themselves. You know, their diaries, their journals, their uh, stuff that they pilfered, all of that, which has now become the property of the, uh, uh, of the army, and therefore uh, you know, displayed in the National Army Museum, uh, there's a wealth of information there, uh, which is yet to be. So I met Jas, the curator of the museum, and he says that less than 1% of that has been catalogued and archived. So there's a huge amount of information. So of I've worked a lot in that, in that archive, and um, particularly for enough white moguls. Um, has a, a, a great deal of, uh, of research there, but also the, the, for the last mogul. Uh, and, the, and you could write the entire history of 1857 from their archive. It's an extraordinary, because what they have, what you get here is official documents, particularly. Right. You get, you get the, everything that's the official. A document starts in, say, a, a minor collectorate in Peshawar. Uh, a precy is written and sent to Calcutta. Uh, and then a precy is written of that, which gets sent to, to Leadenhall Street. So the stuff that's in Peshawar is still in the Peshawar archives or, or in the Lahore archives. The stuff that was in Fort William is now in the National Archives of India in Delhi. But the time, all you, what you've got here in, in, in um, the British Library is the praises from all these different places. Uh, but So you can often follow them upstream. So if you're very interested in something, you can find something here, then go and look in the National Archives and then possibly end up in Allahabad or Madras or wherever it is. We are um, literally down to the last half a minute. So who has the mic? Is somebody with the mic already? Then you may as well I ask do. a question. There won't uh, be time to go look uh, for another question. I'll try to keep it short. So let's leave aside for a minute the ethical question of whether what the company did was right or wrong. And the, the national indignation South Asians might feel you know, South, uh, as to what happened. 
I mean, the Saxons might say the same about the Normans, and ask a question of statecraft. So uh, the question I have is this, technological parity, more or less, tactical parity, you said the, the, the military tactics were adopted by the Indian courts, numerical superiority, superiority in resources. Can, can I put a thesis to you and ask you if you agree or disagree? Was the difference the joint stock company, the idea of governance by committee and voting, and the fact that England was run by parliament, while India was run by arbitrary individuals? Would you agree with that thesis? Was that the difference it's in statecraft? It's hugely important what you say. It's hugely important because what you, the crucial middlemen in all this are the money lenders and the bankers. Now, if, you're a, if you are a, a, a banker sitting in Bengal or sitting in, 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 in Rajasthan or sitting in Varanasi, who do you actually want to lend to? You want to lend to someone that you know will repay you on time with interest. And if you have a choice of lending, say, to some great Maratha uh, general or lending to the East India Company, there are good arguments for lending to the East India Company because they may loot, they may rape, they may pillage but they know to repay on time with interest. They understand commercial contracts. Plus, you kind of, you know, even if you're a vegetarian Jane and they're a beef-eating Englishman, you kind of speak the same commercial language. They understand each other. And that is the nexus which allows the company to borrow the money. And in the anarchy, I followed that trail. This work, incidentally, is, 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 is work that's been done over the last 30 years, largely by Bengali economic historians, it's not my own work at all, and it's all there in, in scholarly journals. But there's been, particularly since Chris Bailey in the 1980s, huge study on the Indian bankers and how they supported the East India Company. Leaving aside the moral question, it's quite clear from a pragmatic reason why it was in their interest uh, to, 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 from a modern point of view, sell the country down the street. It's uh, a, but if I can yeah. just compliment this with a footnote, William Stuteley writes, and of course the Jagat states were hugely rich, it was said they actually dealt with more money every year than the entire Bank of England. But Mom, fam, fam, and fam, almost fam. while this is happening, what's happening in the South, the Dutch decide to invade India, and they decide to do it from the South. And they send a fleet, commanded by the famous uh, Admiral Eustatius de Lannoy, to attack what was then the Kingdom of Travancore, uh, to capture India from the South. And they are roundly defeated by the forces of Travancore uh, under King Marthanda Varma. So not every king was arbitrary and so on and so forth. Not only did he defeat them, but he captured the Dutch commanders. And Eustatius de Lannoy then joined the service of the Maharaja of Travancore and became his captain of artillery. I would just like to say, I hope that someone is tweeting this to, to Shashi's constituents. Because uh, <laughs> we need this man in power. <laughs> The Battle of Kolachel. <laughs> However, Kolachel is now in Tamil Nadu because we lost a good chunk of Travancore to Kanyakumari district. That's another story. But the fact is this happened. So whenever your history books say that the first example of an Asian power defeating a European power is Japan defeating Russia in 1905, wrong. It's Marthanda Varma of Travancore defeating the Dutch in 1741. Vote <laughs> <laughs> All right, on that note, William Dalman calls in the hand. Whatever you did, if it wasn't good enough, you needed to try and do better and keep at it. Actually, village life produces the philosophical ideas that are germane to democratic thought and practice. I mean, just losing four of your bandmates, soulmates is bad enough. But the worst thing is out of those four families, two of the families blamed me. But the progress from 1991 to 2017, I think, only took India to a better place. It was really through the, uh, th through the transition into politics that I, uh, that I had the good luck of becoming a writer.